Good morning, everyone. So glad you're with us on this Wednesday. I'm Jessica Lovell in for Dr. Steve Stites, our chief medical officer. And yes, he will be back tomorrow, not to worry. Um, in the meantime, we are here live inside the Dulce Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. And joining us live from the KCK Chamber of Commerce are representatives from three civic organizations behind the Keep Wyco Well initiative. So a big welcome to KCK Chamber President and CEO Daniel Silva. Marsha Harrington, she is the Senior Director of Business Retention and Workforce Solutions at the Wyandotte Economic Development Council. And we have Alan Carr joining us. He is the Executive Director of the KCK Convention and Visitors Bureau. So we are anxious to hear more about this initiative, see how it is working uh, since it was announced in late August. So we will get to our guests in just a moment. But of course, as always, Dr. Dana Hawkinson is here with me today. And we're going to talk about the numbers. What do you know? Yeah, right. As always, like a bad penny. <laughs> you keep turning up. up. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the numbers are, uh, you know, typically stable. We haven't seen too much fluctuation in the last couple days. Um, we do have 31 patients in the hospital um, that are on the active acute infection status. Eight of those are in the ICU and four of those are on the ventilator, unfortunately. So uh, in Hayes, there are 17 uh, patients in-house. 16 of those are active, so one would be in that recovery stage, and one of those is on the ventilator as well. So, um, you know... Both of our, our systems, both of our hospitals are about steady, but that doesn't really, again, account for discharges that we've had as well as admissions. So it wasn't like there, there haven't been discharges and admissions. There have been in those numbers. It's just the overall number for the day is just about the same as it was yesterday. All right. Well, thanks for explaining that. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So we want to get to our panel today. And we want to start with Alan. Alan, how are you this morning? Thanks for joining us. So we're going to start with you and ask you to kind of uh, tell us a little bit about this initiative, what it is, how it came about. Um, we'll just let you dive right in. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for having us here today to talk uh, talk about Keep Wyco Well. You know, this is a, a joint civic initiative that our three organizations have put together. And really, in a nutshell, we're trying to engage businesses and individuals in Wyandotte County to take a pledge to help stop the spread of coronavirus. And we feel like it's really important for businesses to get involved and and to show their customers that they're taking this seriously and that they're taking steps to help slow, slow the spread of the virus in their businesses. The pledge is it's really simple to take. Uh, you can take it at keepwycowell.com. Uh, for businesses, they, they pledge to some simple steps to slow the spread, but individuals can take, can take the pledge as well. Thank you. Yes, and I did, and it was super easy. It took all of a minute for me to sign up yesterday. Uh, March, I want to get to you. So you've been directly engaging with uh, different businesses um, in Wyandotte County. So was it easy to get them on board for this? Tell me kind of what their reaction to this has been. Yes, so when the pandemic hit about mid-March, uh, we started making phone calls to a number of our businesses. Um, we made over 800 calls, made contact with about 400 companies, and just trying to find out how they were doing. Uh, were they fully functional? Were they having to downsize? Were they laying off? Or were they closed? Um, what, and then we added on, what are you doing if you are fully functional? What are you doing to keep your employees safe? And I have to say the overwhelming majority were going to the nth degree to uh, establish you know, guidelines in their facilities to keep their, their employees safe so that they could keep coming to work every day and so businesses could meet their, their service demands, their uh, order demands, uh, which is very important. Um, so they, you know, social distancing, uh, mass, uh, sanitation, um, closing their doors to anyone coming from the, in, uh, from the outside into the building. Uh, so they really were, um, very good about uh, keeping everyone safe. So Daniel, I know you work with, with hundreds of businesses as well. How has this pandemic overall been affecting uh, how you are working with those businesses? What's been changing? How are you assisting them? Yeah, <clears throat> and the KCK Chamber works with roughly with over 550 plus members throughout the metro area. And, and right away we decided Obviously, we had to go virtual with our with our communications and events, uh, but it became very important for us to be the disseminator of information and making sure that we're connecting our business owners, our members, with the decision makers that were 
uh, early on making the decisions on COVID, on whether we were going to stay at home, shut down businesses, it became very important for us to make sure that the right information was given to our business owners. So I just want to remind people throughout throughout the update where you go. So you go to visit Kansas City, Kansas, visit KansasCityKC.com slash keep Wyco well. You go on and take a really quick, um, just it's a quick click on, enter your information, and you're in. You've taken the pledge. Uh, but I was reading over it, and Dr. Hawkins said, I want to tell you about this because it really is four simple things. It's wearing a mask, social distancing, um, using appropriate hygiene practices, uh, monitoring your health, staying home when you're sick, and then, of course, my favorite is practice kindness and patience towards employees um, and guests um, as you enter into businesses. So we never want to forget about that. But this has got to be kind of music to your ears because this is a, goes along with everything you've been talking about for the last five, six months. Just yeah. if we all do the same thing yeah. every day consistently, we can kind of beat this, right? Right, absolutely. And we know that can happen happen in communities, um, certainly in, you know, the size of our country and the population and the different communities, it's difficult for one blanket thing to occur, for everybody to agree, and we've seen that. Uh, but certainly in the communities, and this is one more step towards getting our community to be, um, you know, 100% um, on board with this because it is about our community and um, the people that live in it, the businesses that need to thrive so that people can eat and have uh, food on their table and support each other. So it's very important for this to be going on, for sure. All right. Alan, I wanted to ask you just to, uh, to talk about a little bit about tourism, kind of paint a picture of what tourism was like pre-COVID, uh, then we go into the shutdown, and now as we've come out of this, what kind of changes are you seeing? Is there any good news? Yeah, you know, obviously there's a lot of industries that have been hit really hard with uh, COVID and tourism is definitely one that's been hit really hard. You know, if you think about it, you know, we're all about uh, bringing people in from other places, um, gathering in groups, all of the things that you're not supposed to do during COVID. And so this has had a, a large impact on the tourism economy. And, and one of our motivations with uh, Keep Wyco Well is we want to show people that we as a county are taking this seriously, that we're taking the steps that uh, health professionals are recommending to slow the spread here and communicate that we the, the businesses that are open and that are operating, they're doing it safely um, with the guidelines that are being recommended and that we're a safe place to come and visit. Uh, in terms of the impact that we've seen to tourism, it's been it's been uh, pretty harsh uh, in in the days of the of the shutdown. Um, our, one of the ways we measure is through hotel occupancy. Those visitors coming in, uh, hotels hit about 18 percent occupancy here in Wyandotte County. Um, typically, that should be around 50 percent to 60 percent for that time of year. Uh, we have seen as as restrictions have lessened, we've seen that go up a, a little bit. Uh, so. So, so we are um, down about 30% from where we were before, but a number of businesses are still impacted. You know, any, any place where uh, there's large groups that, that need to gather, there's obviously large restrictions there. Meetings and conventions aren't happening a, as they used to. Uh, but, but people love to travel, and, and so people are finding different ways to travel where they can be on their own, uh, where they can do things outdoors, and, and we're trying to encourage those things. And, and I think the message we just want to, want to get out to every, every, everyone that, that's interested in visiting is, you know, we are as a county taking this seriously, and businesses can help us spread that message by signing the Keep Wet Go Well pledge. And take advantage of some staycation time. I think you were mentioning that's a good way to get out there, right? Absolutely. Hey, Jill, do we have some, um, I'm, I'm going to get to some questions from our community, but I just first want to check and see if we have any reporters on the line. And I don't think we do. So, Jill, let's uh, just jump in with you. Nice to see your face today. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have a tough question out of the gate for all three of our panelists. Liz lives in Wyandotte County, and she says, there is no incentive for me to get tested. If I get tested, I test positive, I'm at home, and now I can't work, and I can't feed my family. What can you do to help me? Marsha, let's, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on that? Well, there are a number of organizations that are assisting um, individuals and in, in that are going through what she is now too. Um, Catholic Charities is one. Um, United Way um, has resources as well. And there, there are a number of others too. 
Um, so uh, I would suggest that she contact one of those two uh, organizations, and if they can't assist her or fully, then they will uh, relay her, uh, refer her to another organization. There are a lot of people in this in this uh, situation, so uh, mm -hmm. Wyandotte County is is really uh, ramped up to help individuals. Daniel, what's your conversation like with businesses as far as that goes? What are you talking to businesses about? Well, I think for us it's really important to continue to communicate to our businesses that if they are reopening or opening or are open, to do so as safely as possible and follow all the protocols put forth by the public health department. Um, ourselves as an organization, you know, we're a smaller team, uh, but we made sure to put in the proper protocols and measures for our employees to come back and we actually had our staff come back on June 1, uh, but we've been able to do so in a very safe way. And so I think the communication to our businesses is if you're gonna be open, our, and you need to be flexible also with your employees and especially now that school has started, um, you know, be as flexible as possible and try to deal with pandemic as, as best as possible. Dr. Hawkinson, you have some advice on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there is incentive. Individually, there is incentive, and, and the main incentive is to stop the spread of the disease. Certainly, if you are ill and you go to work and it spreads in that workplace, there's a very good chance that work may be shut down and, and there, may no be, there may not be work or there may be furlough or something like that. You know, it, it is the incentive is to stop the spread of the disease because we know this virus can get into vulnerable populations. So, you know, we've seen this countless times on case reports. You know, there was the recent wedding in Maine where it spread to 140 some people, uh, three deaths at least, or more than that. So the incentive really is to stop the spread of the disease. So certainly more testing and getting tested is gonna be the important responsible thing to do. Jill, next question. Yeah, this is from Tanya, and it might be good for the chamber to consider um, helping her understand. She wants to know, she says, wouldn't it be great if just all businesses tested their staff frequently, especially if they are in contact with a lot of people? Why wouldn't that work? Mm -hmm. Daniel? Yeah, great question. And obviously, we again, we want our businesses to take as many precautions as possible. I think this initiative is, is a step in the right direction. We want folks to take the pledge and really um, adhere to, to the protocols that are put forth. Um, absolutely, we, we want our businesses to be as safe as possible and adhere to these guidelines so that the customer feels safe, awesome. the employees feel safe, and the business owner is safe as well. How realistic is that, Dr. Hawkinson? Yeah. I mean, optimally, we want testing accessible for everybody whenever they want it, whether it's once a day, once every other day. There are issues with testing capacity, so the amount of, of workforce it requires to do some of these tests, including the PCR test. There are issues with testing supplies, either for the PCR test or the antigen test. And then, of course, there are issues with the antigen test sensitivity. It may not be as sensitive as the PCR test. Um, and some people think, well, if it's, if it's negative, then that means you aren't really having infectious virus concentration or viral load anyway. So there are theories behind that. But yeah, the optimal practice would be to test everybody once a day or once every other day, whether that's in a school setting, whether that's in a employment setting, you know, whatever office you're in. We just don't have that mechanism uh, internally for public health, but also for testing, uh, especially in regards to capacity with workforce as well as um, the supplies needed. So, but that would be, that's an excellent point. And yes, we would like that, but right now we just don't, we don't have that ability. So before the vaccine gets here, do we ever imagine a time where, and I know we've talked about this earlier in the pandemic, because it's a question that people wanted to know, where we could do a daily test for kids before they go to school mm -hmm. and workers before they walk through the door. Is that even a realistic you know, thing to think about? Yeah, there are resources towards that. Again, there are um, certainly camps that are, that are wanting to do that. Um, that is moving forward. It's just, can we get the supplies? Mm -hmm. Can we get that accurate test to be able to do 
where it is cheap and it is um, efficacious and you can get a rapid result. So all those things are, are moving rapidly. There is research going towards that and production, but right now we just don't have that. I want to ask our panel a little bit about a little bit about the masking culture in Wyandotte County. Marsha, I'll start with you. Just um, tell me a little bit about that, how the masking culture has changed from, from maybe in the beginning of the pandemic to now. And then, Alan, tell me a little bit about what it's like um, for the tourists that come over into your into your space. Well, it seems that when, you know, when the pandemic hit, hit everyone was wearing masks and, and being really good about it. And then when we um, started going back to work, it seemed like people got a little lax with that. And now they've come back around, uh, especially the retail, um, bigger retail uh, companies. But um, they've come around now and uh, their employees are wearing masks. Uh, they require masks to be uh, worn inside their buildings. So that's really good. And I think, I think this campaign really helps keep us kind of, keep the front and center that we all need to take an individual responsibility with um, following the, the guidelines that, that we've talked about this morning. And it's just a reminder. We're trying to continually keep this as a reminder to keep everyone well, uh, everyone working, uh, our economy booming, and um, you know, uh, just be safe. Get everybody well. Alan, our tourists yeah, and, doing it right? And you know, I, I think one of the things Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the things we see for for tourism and you know and, and tourism doesn't even necessarily mean coming out going out being from out of town, you know, we're seeing a lot of local people here in the metro. Um, people are, are, are having a, a, a tough time trying to make the decision of, is it safe to do certain things? That's the biggest concern we see from surveys. And, and one of the biggest challenges for businesses right now is, is for customers to believe that it's safe to go out and do those activities. And, 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 that, and masking is one of the areas that we see come up the most is something that, that visitors mention as something that they want to see. They, they want to see people wearing masks and we know it's required right now in Wyandotte County. Um, and we, we see some places that I, I think do a really good job, but I, you know, I've certainly been in a couple places where not enough customers are wearing masks. And so that's where I think we really need people to take this seriously and uh, from a business standpoint, take the pledge and, and, and have your business to let everyone know that your business is taking it serious, seriously. But as an individual, you know, take the pledge and, and wear a mask because we know that that is going to help all of us get through this. So for those of you just joining us, we're talking about the Keep Wyco Well initiative. And so all you have to do is go to visit KansasCityKS.com slash Keep Wyco Well. Take the pledge that you as an individual or you as a business are going to uh, take on the responsibility of keeping yourself and those around you safe. Jill, next question. We got lots of them and they're really good. Here's one from John Paul. He says, why can you go to the casino but no activities at the soccer complex? He said that seems to be selective areas where it is safe and not safe and that's confusing to him. He'd like you to comment. Let's go out to our panel. Marsha, what are your thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, one that I've had too. And I don't know as if I have a really good answer for that. Um, apparently someone has made that decision that um, that would take place. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that logically or rationally. Um, it, you know, maybe with the the sports uh, people were trying to really keep children safe and families safe um, but um, now we know you know the the uh, the virus doesn't affect children as as much as it does uh, adults so I, I I can't answer that really well sorry well, I, Daniel I <laughs> think the kind of the question I, that. yeah please do because I think the question is why why are there different rules for different businesses mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I actually helped set on the advisory task force uh, for the health department and the, and the county as they were putting this together. And I think one of the things that, that, you know, I'll leave it to the health professionals to talk about kind of specific situations. But I think one of the things we see with some of these different venues is how people are gathering. So for sporting events, you know, you, in order to play, a, especially team sports, you've got to come into close 
contact with others. Um, going to a casino, it's a large space and you're able to be a little more socially distanced. And so I think part of the motivation as we looked at, at as they looked at different size venues, was to look at the size of the venue, the type of attraction, the type of activities people are gonna do, and that was really the motivation for the rules. So Dr. Hawkinson, how, how big of a difference does it make? outside, inside, the ability to social distance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's everything. Yeah, certainly. And I don't know if the, if the soccer complex, if they're talking about the Wyandotte Fields or if they're talking about sporting, you know, uh, Children's Mercy Park um, versus the casino. So certainly there are probably different rules there, as we just heard. Um, obviously, some of it could be capacity. What is the um, capacity within that casino and what percentage are they allowing people in now? Certainly for outdoors, whether it's a soccer complex for youth sports or whether it's Children's Mercy, you know, uh, if we're talking about sporting, there are limits on gatherings, so that's another big issue. And again, certainly outdoors is going to be better than indoors. Um, and it's just something that we need to continue to look at. We know that other places around the metro area are allowing those youth sports to go on. So I think it will be continually looked at and evaluated. Is this going to be safe for our, our, our people that are coming in, but also our residents? And um, again, we are trying to uh, build this airplane while we're flying it. We're trying to do the best thing to keep everybody healthy. Um, but I think continue evaluation as new data comes up is the best thing that we can do and then make decisions based on that. Jill? All right. Michael says he's confused. He said that Dr. Hawkinson said Monday, regardless of testing positive or negative, the person has to quarantine for 14 days. Did he hear you correctly? He said, I'll stay home if I'm sick, but doesn't merely being tested invite not only quarantine for you, but for those around you. Can you help explain? It is confusing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, I guess I don't ex understand the question exactly. Jill, so, can, you, can you help him better understand what Michael's referring to? I think, first of all, it's sort of two parts, but mm -hmm. should you stay home regardless if, it's, if you have a positive or a negative test for 14 days if you've had an exposure? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that isn't true. So if you are a contact of a known case of so somebody you know has it and you've been in contact with them, if you are tested and you are positive, then you are supposed to be isolated, not quarantined, isolated for 10 days from that positive result. If you have just been in contact with somebody who has it but don't have any symptoms, then you need to quarantine for 14 days. Um, it's a little bit different than the isolation, but it's basically staying out of the public as well. But what if you tested negative? So the CDC recommends that everybody who is a close contact should be tested. They don't give any guidance as to when do you test. Do you test one day after being in contact with that case, or is it three? Um, we really don't know. We think that the further you get out from your initial exposure, certainly the first one to two days, you're more than likely to have a negative. You can have a positive. But if it's more that six, seven, eight day mark from your exposure, you are more likely to have a positive. So if you are positive, again, and you are tested then, then you need to isolate for 10 days. If you are negative, that negative test still does not get you out of quarantine. You still need to quarantine for that 14 days. So okay. um, it is a little bit difficult concept to understand. Um, you know, why would the CDC say we need to test when they don't give any guidance as to exactly when to test? Because we don't know. We know that you can still develop the disease 14 days and sometimes even longer, but for the most part, many, many people, if they do develop symptoms, will develop it within that 14 days. We know the incubation period of the virus is 14 days, so you still need to quarantine for that 14 days. So I hope that helps clear it up, but we're certainly happy to answer further if it didn't. Jill, was there a second part to Michael's question? Pardon me? Say was, there a second, was there a second part to Michael's question or is he, do you think we got it cleared up for him? I, I think that that addressed what he was saying. He was just, actually Lori kind of has a similar sort of question that goes along with Michael. You know, these questions remind me of the uh, math word problems you used to get right, where you have to figure things out. So I'm gonna give you the first part of Lori's word math problem. She said, if a person at home, their babysitter tested positive for COVID and they have three children, does all the children, mom and dad, 
have they all been exposed and should they all quarantine? That's the first part. Yeah, so the whoever was in contact with that babysitter would be considered a contact. If mom or dad is at work and comes home but hasn't had any contact with that babysitter, typically they would be considered a contact of the contact, and the contact in this case would be the child. The actual case would be the babysitter. So typically we have not had contacts of contacts need to be quarantined. So if there is no um, interaction with that person who is positive, i.e. the babysitter in this case, then you would not really necessarily need to quarantine that's at that a good, point. That's a good point because we talk about how far removed you have to be from the contacts. Right. But so. it is certainly dangerous um, if your children are being uh, babysat by them and they are in contact. You know, there is certainly, we know that in the household, typically household attack rates are about 15 to 30 percent depending on what um, what publication you're looking at, what study you're looking at. So, But, but that's where we've kind of landed. So 15 to 20 to 30 percent of secondary attack rates in the home. But again, if you're a contact of that case, then yes, you have to quarantine. Typically, we do not have contacts of contacts having to quarantine. Jill? Second part of her question, dad gets a rapid test. If negative, can he go back to work or does he and the family have to quarantine? Mm -hmm. So right now, the rapid test, and if by rapid test, you mean that the, it's the antigen test, um, that does require a confirmatory PCR test as well. So yes, if you test negative, if you are a contact and you get a PCR test or a rapid antigen test and you test negative within that 14 days of quarantine, you still have to write out your quarantine for 14 days from your last known exposure. Jill? And the last part of this question, math problem, what happens now if during the quarantine the child gets sick with COVID. Does that extend dad's quarantine longer? It's so confusing. Yes, it typically will extend uh, the quarantine longer. You're exactly right. Um, a lot of this information can be found on the cdc.gov. Um, I think under the section, what do I do if I'm a contact or what if I've been exposed? Um, it does get um, very difficult, especially again, like we talked about in the household where you may have different people presenting at different times. Um, so it does get very, very difficult. But overall, understand that testing negative does not get you out of quarantine. You still have to write out your 14 days of quarantine. So, but the, the quarantine would essentially kind of start over, if you will, if somebody now is showing the symptoms. You would have, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that kind was of start from scratch. Um, I want to get back out to our panel really quick as we're talking about the Keep Wyco Well initiative um, with our guests today. But... Um, I wanted to ask you all, so kind of what makes this this particular initiative in Wyandotte County unique? Because I know this is uh, similar initiatives are happening throughout the state and actually across the country. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about why why this is different. Sure. Um, you know, I'm very proud to be part of this initiative. It's a collaboration between the Wyandotte Economic Development Council, the CVB, and the chamber and that I know of, I'm not sure how many other communities have brought these types of civic organizations together to get behind us. So I'm very proud of this collaboration. So I think that's what makes it unique here in this metro area. Uh, Daniel, I have you there. Just, you know, in general, kind of how are you helping businesses? How, you know, how are during this pandemic, what kind of resources are you providing for them? You know, right away, again, uh, we, we decided that we were going to extend our services to not just our, our chamber members, but the entire community. And again, it was very important for us to get the right information to the business owners. And as plans were being developed in terms of how to reopen safely, how to bring back the employees, you know, we were very much at the table and communicating that information to our members. Um, you know, we, were, we would have liked to have seen more alignment across the metro. Uh, but we've been working hard to ensure that our members have the right information, um, you know, to, to be able to do so safely, open, reopen safely. And I just want to bounce across the table to Marsha. Uh, so talk to me, uh, kind of the same question with the Wyandotte Economic Development Council. You said you've uh, helped over, reached out to over 400 different businesses, making sure they have the resources they need. Um, what are you hearing from them? What are you helping them out with? 
We, we did. We want to make sure that they knew about the, the federal resources that came out initially. Um, some had heard about it, some had not, so uh, we, were, we were happy to be able to refer them to the resources. Um, and uh, a number of them, when we've made follow-up calls, uh, a number of them did apply for that federal funding. Now there's uh, some state funding available and local funding, and we're making sure they know about that as well. Um, and again, a number of them are, are uh, applying for that as well. And I know the Chamber's been involved with that too. All right, let's take a couple more questions, Jill. Shalene says, and, and this might be also another opportunity to help explain things a little bit. She says what they really need in Wyandotte County is sick leave for employees and regular testing. She said without these two things, it's just going to get worse. Um, how, can, how, can, um, how can businesses do that? Daniel, do you wanna start us off with that? Yeah, and you know, again, regarding the sick leave, I think for employers, you know, everyone's kind of, those sole proprietors are making their decisions. Um, I think what we want to do is, again, encourage people to, to look out for one another um, and take care of your employees, uh, be flexible. Um, and again, I'll, I'll use our organization as an example. I mean, we absolutely are trying to be as flexible as possible. You know, remote working is obviously an option, uh, but I think it's important for employers to be as flexible as possible during these trying times. Jill? Uh, we got a question from Adrienne. She said, presumptive case, should they continue to isolate for 10, even at 10 days, even after a negative test? And what about their close contacts? Because a presumptive is now negative. This, it, it really is confusing, but let's go over it again. Yeah, I mean, presumptive case meaning symptoms or was it the negative test? She says presumptive case, should they continue to isolate for 10 days even after a negative test? You know, if it's a presumptive case, I'm not sure the details within that. Have you been exposed to somebody who you know has had it? Um, it, it depends. You know, certainly we know that the antigen test, the rapid test can be false negative. I think it depends exactly what those um, details are about that. If you've been exposed to somebody who has it, you're probably better off than certainly um, isolating for those 10 days when you first started developing symptoms. Um, you know, if you don't develop symptoms, if it's a presumptive case, we're assuming you have symptoms. So I think it's the more conservative approach is to stay isolated for those 10 days. Mm -hmm. Again, it depends exactly what kind of test it is, but you are always welcome to go back and repeat a test, say in 48 hours. But if you have symptoms and you've been around somebody who you know is a uh, confirmed case, then your most conservative approach and the best thing to do would be to isolate for 10 days um, after your symptom onset. Again, to stop the spread of disease. Um, don't know exactly what kind of, of negative test that was, if it was, again, if it was the antigen or the PCR, but being a presumptive case and being around somebody who's had it, again, probably need to isolate for those 10 days after your symptom onset. I'm glad you keep going over this because it is really confusing as we yeah. move down the road, so Jill. And she did clarify too, she wrote in and texted that the symptoms were after she tested negative. Could that be a possible one of those cases where you point out and say, mm -hmm. your test is good for that moment? Yeah, exactly. We understand that whether it's the antigen or the PCR test, that test is really good for that day. And what happens after that, um, it could be the disease process because, you know, again, we understand that's why we say quarantine for 14 days. Um, you may develop symptoms at day 12. We had an employee here who was exposed um, at, you know, out in the community, but was on quarantine at home, developed symptoms at 12 days. So that does happen. So even if you're testing at seven or eight days, you may still develop symptoms at 10 days or 12 days of that quarantine. All right, so I'm just clarifying this for myself. So you're saying that if, um, so what I, wait then and, and isolate if I've been exposed to somebody and I'm showing the symptoms but I haven't gotten tested yet, isolate? Or are you saying to, um, to quarantine um, if you don't have the symptoms? So you're basically you're kind of waiting for the symptoms to show up before you get tested? Correct. Okay. But again, CDC does recommend anybody who's been in close contact does get tested. 
we just don't have a lot of guidance as to when after that exposure you get tested. Right. Okay. I would probably recommend not getting tested before three days, okay. but then after that, certainly, um, you know, five, six, seven days, you may have a better chance to have a positive test if you truly are positive. But if you've had the exposure, you get tested, it's negative, and then you get symptoms, get retested. Yes. Got it. Jill? Uh, yeah, so Gene wrote in and he goes, Lee Summit schools are now starting to do more in-person classes. He's worried about um, about that happening, and he just wants to know, uh, going into the fall, what your thoughts are on that. How do they do that safely? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think a lot of, there have been a lot of stories that certainly cases are on the rise around the United States, and especially depending on what community you and what we have really found is that this virus, this infection, this disease really centers on communities. So what's happening, um, you know, down south or in New York is not really what's happening here. So we really have to understand the individual community d dynamics of the viral infection. But we do understand that in general cases are on the rise. We do understand that in general cases in younger children are on the rise too. And while, you know, thank the Lord, for the most part, children are really not affected by this, they can still spread it. So they can still spread it to other vulnerable populations or people who may not be too vulnerable but, but are still older and then can spread it. It can still spread through that means. So I think you have to look at the individual school district and the individual school. And the best people to know about that, of course, are the people that are in charge of that school district and in charge of those particular buildings. So if you can make those engineering changes where you can space people out where you can have the adults in the school, the teachers, the administrators, the counselors, the coaches, especially the coaches. You know, we understand that people want to do athletics now, and that has been a big push. So certainly we understand that those teams are in closer proximity probably than many of the classrooms. So it's incumbent and important for the coaches to understand that and be the leaders to wear their masks correctly to encourage social distancing. But if that can be done in that individual school district or in that individual school where you can implement the masking, the distancing as much as possible, the not meeting in large groups or recess for lunch and things of that nature, things that we've talked about, you are more than likely going to reduce the risk as much as possible because we know it's in the community. So if it's in the community, you have to assume that it will be in the schools. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter, can you take those uh, precautions to help reduce that risk? that it comes into your school. Good question. Jill? All right, our final question today is, um, several people wanting to know, just what is the key symptom now of COVID? If I just get a headache and that's all I have, am I possibly have COVID? If I'm just getting diarrhea, do I have COVID? If I get diarrhea one day and then the next day I have a headache, is it COVID? Because I think that's what people have been saying. Can I yeah. just be regular sick or is now everything COVID? Can I just yeah. have the headache? No. Yeah. Well, you can be regular sick. That is for sure. <laughs> and as know? we get into respiratory viral season, meaning influenza, other common coughs and colds, rhinovirus, metanumavirus, other common coronaviruses, a lot of these symptoms overlap. So it is very difficult to understand. And that is why we need more accurate and more accessible testing for everybody. Um, right now, we don't necessarily have that. So it is very difficult. Again, historically, from the Chinese experience, they just published on fever, cough, shortness of breath. Well, we know that's not true now. Um, we understand that there was a, I think it was a college team or one of the NFL teams, maybe it was a college team, that one of the players was throwing up and vomiting on the sideline. They thought it was just dehydration. Well, it turned out to be COVID. Mm. So we understand that. Um, it can have a myriad of symptoms and it can range. And all of these symptoms are nonspecific. And so the best thing to do is either call your public health department or call your medical team and be, uh, um, see if you can get tested because we just don't know at this point in time. Obviously, if you've had known exposure to somebody, you're probably more than likely want to get tested. If you have done other things in group settings, um, whether it's parties, weddings, funerals, if you've gone out to eat at restaurants, within the last two weeks, you probably want to go get tested. But it is very difficult because we know that the symptoms um, really are nonspecific and are general and can range from the respiratory symptoms to uh, you know, headache, to nausea, vomiting, things of that nature, to just muscle aches. So it's very difficult. 
the first thing to do would probably be assess, you know, have you been around anybody that you know has had it? Have you been in those other settings where it is high risk that you can get it? Call your medical uh, providers, call the health department if you don't have a regular doctor and see what you can do about getting tested. Really know your body, right? Yes. And the history of how, mm -hmm. how you do, certainly this time of year, that's for sure. All right, great questions today. Thanks everyone for sending those in. Uh, we wanna uh, give a huge thanks to our panel, um, Alan and Daniel and Marcia. So I wanna get their final thoughts. But before we do that, again, we, we've been talking about the Keep Wyco Well initiative. You can go visit, go to visit KC or visit KansasCityKS.com slash Keep Wyco Well. Go on there, take the pledge to keep yourself, keep our community safe. Um, before I go out there, so yeah, so when the businesses go on, they'll get this sticker that they put inside um, their business to say that they have taken the pledge. You can also go on and get this cool um, Keep Wyco Well mask, uh, which I've now added to my collection. Remember when I just, I just had one, I used to have one yeah. mask and now mm -hmm. I have Dozens of masks, so I'm adding this. Uh, you can go on there, order one of those. So it's very cool. Just mask to let, fashion is all the rage. It is all about the mask fashion. I'm telling you so right, now. right now. So yeah, very cool. Just to let everybody know that we're all on the same page. We're all in it together. So thank you, um, all three of you, for being involved. But um, Marsha, let's start with you. Just, just kind of, what are your final thoughts? What do you want us to know about um, just keeping our businesses safe in this initiative overall? Well. I think we've all learned and, and we are very aware that keeping businesses operational, healthy, keeping employees healthy is good for the economy. It's good for everyone because when an employee is getting a paycheck, then they're able to pay their bills, they're mm -hmm. able to buy groceries, they're able to buy gas, um, and if there's any leftover, go out to eat. Um, or go to an entertainment venue uh, if it's open. So, um, you know, keep everyone just needs to really take personal responsibility and not only for themselves, but for those around them. Alan, your final thoughts this morning? Thank you for being with us, by the way. Yeah, thanks for having us. You know, I, if you're a business owner in Wyandotte County, uh, we would like you to take the pledge, join businesses like uh, Nebraska Furniture Mart, Kansas City, Kansas Community College, Great Wolf Lodge, Rosedale Barbecue, Kansas City Cupcake Company, and and take the pledge, look for the decal uh, in, in their windows if, 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 if you're patronizing those businesses. And if you're an individual, take the pledge, take personal responsibility, take precautions to prevent uh, the coronavirus. Daniel, your final thoughts and the importance of this initiative? Yeah, I, th I think my message will be, again, let, let's all think about, think about this. We're all in this together. I think from a business standpoint, we absolutely do not want to and cannot afford to move back into a more restrictive phase where businesses are shutting down. You know, we have to look out for one another and keep each other safe. Um, and so, I'm, again, I'm really proud of this initiative. And we're encouraging uh, not just businesses, but community members to really take this seriously. Thank you all, we really appreciate it. Okay, log on, take the pledge. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to, to hear that it is confusing. Obviously, there are a lot of details here for the general public. Uh, and that can add to COVID weariness syndrome for sure. What are all these messages? What do I know what to do? So certainly, if you have known exposure to a, a case, then you need to quarantine for 14 days. It is recommended that you get tested, but there is no good guidance on when to get tested. I would suggest at least probably not before five days. So anywhere between that five to seven to eight day mark if you can. Um, certainly we know people can develop symptoms before that, but then it's easy if you're having symptoms, you're gonna go get tested. Um, but even if you test negative, that does not get you out of the 14 day quarantine. So that's important to understand. And even any point after that test that you've gotten, you could develop symptoms and at that point you probably do need to go get a test because now you are having symptoms. So it is difficult to understand. We will try to continue to be clear and answer these questions for you. Um, and again, I know that that is probably one of the reasons that can cause um, COVID weariness syndrome as well. So we'll be here to try and clarify for all those things um, in the future as well. Well, what I hear when I hear those questions is that people are confused and they want to do it right. So yeah. they, they want clarification. Mm -hmm. So that's that's good news that people aren't just going, well, I don't know, so I guess I'll just do whatever. But right. they're saying, well, let's, let's clear this up. What do you mean by that? So I can do it right. So that's pretty good news. All right. Thanks, Dr. Hawkinson, for that. Okay. So tomorrow, coming up tomorrow, yes, Dr. Stites is back, I promise. And it's Halloween month, officially kicking off tomorrow. And that brings on the worry about the spread of COVID-19. Already talking about Halloween. Is it on? Is it off? 
haunted houses, though, those are a huge concern. Our guest tomorrow is Spencer Terry, general manager of the Fear Factory. Spencer is also a board member of the National Haunted Attraction Association. So he's going to join us from Salt Lake City, Utah, with a list of precautions and questions that you need to consider before you decide to send your, out, your kids out trick-or-treating or visit those local haunted houses. So we'll get that all cleared up tomorrow. Of course, we always love showing your masks here on the update. So here are a couple of those for you. Deb sent this in. Check this out. Dr. Hawkinson, you'll love this. This is her little threesome. Mm -hmm. They're happy to wear their face masks and shields, and they're protecting their eyes while they're traveling, just as Dr. Hawkinson says to do. Way to go. Way to go, girls. All right, so Julie, this is um, uh, the, this is 13 year old writer. He's also down with wearing the mask. He's kind of got like a that looks like my Vans. That's yeah, kind of does. a cool mask, mm -hmm. isn't that? Okay, so he does it even when he's outdoors on the water. He's really well self distanced, but he's really doing it to keep everyone else safe. So we appreciate that, Ryder. Great job. Great job on masking. Send us your masking photos to um, at KU Hospital or the Medical News Network at KUMC. Dot edu. Send those in. We'll show them right here. Again, thank you for being with us this morning. Dr. Seitz is back bright and early tomorrow. Make it a great day. We'll see you then.